Ricardo and Albon crash out, Max Verstappen takes his third consecutive win at Suzuka, and Yuki Tsunoda claims his first points on home soil. Let's analyse the 2024 Japanese Grand Prix. It was Max Verstappen who took his third win for the season and his third win around Suzuka today, equaling Michael Schumacher for the most consecutive wins at Japan. Sergio Perez came home P2 to make it Red Bull's third 1-2 finish of the season, and Carlos Sainz finished in P3, which means he's been on the podium in every race he's finished so far this year. We saw a crash between Daniel Ricciardo and Alex Albon at the beginning of the race, which meant a red flag and a restart on lap 3, and Zhou Guan Yu also DNF'd because of a gearbox issue. Though the conditions started out warm, it got cloudier as the race went on, which no doubt benefited Ferrari, and allowed Charles Leclerc to climb from P8 to P4. It was Lando Norris who finished in P5 with Fernando Alonso in P6, Oscar Piastri found himself in a Mercedes sandwich in P8 with George Russell ahead and Lewis Hamilton behind, and Yuki Tsunoda rounded out the top 10 to take his first points on home soil, and to make it the first time a Japanese driver has scored at the Japanese Grand Prix since Kobayashi in 2012. Let's get into the action. Of course, it was another dominant weekend for Red Bull as Max Verstappen won the Japanese Grand Prix with Sergio Perez coming home in P2. But how do you think they'll reflect on the weekend? I think they're going to be extremely happy with how they performed this weekend. Obviously, Max Verstappen is just in a league of his own. He finished 12.535 seconds ahead of Sergio Perez in P2. And I think Sergio Perez should be happy with how he's performing as well. He seems to be a lot more confident in this car. Um, and I think he's performing exactly how Red Bull would want him to. Obviously, Max is taking the wins and Sergio is taking P2 and they're finishing 1-2. So I don't think that they can have any complaints, really. No, Christian Horner said today after the race that that seat is now Checo's to lose. I mean, of course it was anyway, but I think he seems a lot more confident this year, as you said. Um, and if we compare this Japanese Grand Prix to the one we had just seven months ago at the end of last season look at what he did there you know he had a double dnf he crashed into magnuson a little bit out of desperation at the time and the checo we're seeing now i think looks vastly different to the one we had back then i think he probably felt although his contract is ending this year i think he felt a little bit under threat last year um i don't really know why perhaps it was to do with daniel ricardo being promoted back up to that alpha tower seat and just waiting in the wings a little bit more and that threat has obviously gone away slightly more this year um but yeah, I mean, good for Checo. I think he's having a fantastic time. And if he carries on like this, I don't really see a reason why Red Bull wouldn't sign him on for 25 and even perhaps beyond. He's doing exactly what they want out of a second driver at the minute. Exactly. I think he's driving in a much more mature way to how he was mm. last year. And I think if he continues like this, we might see the narrative changing from Checo's getting kicked out of the seat, who's going to replace him, to, OK, Checo's keeping this seat. Where are these other people going to go in the driver market for 2025? Yeah, I think Red Bull as a team as well are just performing at such a high level. They had incredible pit stops throughout the Grand Prix. Um, two 2.1 second pit stops for Checo and a 2.0 second for Max. And it's just been a faultless race really for Red Bull. Um, despite issues with getting long runs in free practice and the, the issues with the wet running, um, they managed to recover from that. Obviously, everybody was at a disadvantage because of that. But they managed to come out of that and still be as strong as they are in any other Grand Prix, which is just absolutely incredible in my opinion. Yeah, that's the thing that's impressing me most, I think, about them, aside from obviously Max's dominance and his ability to convert a pole to a win every single time, it seems, is their resilience as well. I mean, at last time out in Australia, we saw Checo having issues, Max obviously DNF'd, and they've come back from that. They've taken a dominant one too, many seconds back to Ferrari and P3 and beyond. Um, and as you say, the pit stops were flawless the team just seemed to be running on a different level. I mean, we knew this already, obviously, um, but it seems hard to see how anyone could stop them right now. Exactly. It's quite impressive as well. I wonder what's going on within the organisation um, that when they make a mistake, they're able to recover from that so quickly mm. and not make that same mistake again. Obviously, yeah. we had Max's issue with the brake, um, with the brakes overheating on Australia, and I doubt we'll ever see this issue ever happen again for Red Bull. Somehow they're able to iron out these issues straight away. And it, I mean, it's just very impressive. So speaking of ironing out issues, we're seeing Ferrari at the moment seem to be on a bit of a turn of form under their Fred Vasseur leadership. Carlos Sainz took a podium today, uh, finishing in P3. He started from P4. Charles Leclerc finished P4 and started from P8. They ran some alternate strategies down at Ferrari today. Uh, Carlos on the two-stop, while Charles actually ran the one-stop and made that work. So how did they manage that and what effect do you think that had on the result for them? Yeah, so obviously Ferrari have had quite a lot of issues with degradation, especially last year. And I mean, I think Charles running this one-stop has kind of showed us that they're working through that. If not, they're almost, you know, looking at the back end of that. 
Um, I'm feeling really good for Ferrari at the moment. I think obviously Carlos is on a turn of form, which is just unbelievable kind of thing. He, he had that appendix surgery and won the Grand Prix two weeks after. Um, and now he's taken another podium and he's had a podium finish in every race that he's been in, which is just incredible. Um, I'm wondering if Ferrari are thinking twice about letting him go now. Um, <laughs> but obviously that's going to do wonders for him in the 2025 driver market. Yeah, but obviously they're on a good turn of form at the moment and I'm feeling good for them heading into the next Grand Prix. Yeah, they definitely seem to have a very strong pace at the moment. It was the strong pace today that helped Charles carry off the uh, one stop rather than it being the tyres, I think. Um, you know, Lando Norris was questioning at the end of the race whether he could have been on that one stop um, because he questioned whether McLaren stopped him a bit too early. Um, and he obviously saw how it was working for the Ferraris, but they just didn't have the pace. So it was definitely the race pace that helped Ferrari today. And that probably was helped by the cloudy weather. Uh, Carlos was also questioning whether the one stop would have been better for him uh, because of this, the cloudy weather sort of mimicking that there was better tire, de tire degradation than there perhaps would have been had the sun been out. Um, so yeah, I guess the weather was on their side today uh, in making their strategies work. Um, but Carlos, we know we saw him do plenty of overtakes after his second stop. He had to, some cars to clear to be able to get back to that podium and he used that race pace effectively. We know he's obviously an incredibly good racing driver. Um, I mean, Ferrari seem to be doing incredibly well in the races. Their qualifying, strangely, versus last year is actually where they need to be focusing their efforts at the moment, I think, you know. Whether that's with their tyre warm-up, we saw Charles having some big issues with the tyre warm-up over the single lap uh, on Saturday, potentially because the weather was cooler and he just couldn't get the temperature into the tyres. So there's obviously still some work to do surrounding tyres for Ferrari. Their issues aren't completely gone, um, but I have more faith that they can fix these issues under Fred Vasseur than I did under their previous leadership, let's say. Um, he seems to have a proactive plan of how he's going to sort these things out, and I think that's giving confidence to their drivers um, and is perhaps bolstering Carlos to go and get these performances while he can, you know, and put in the best drives that he can while he's on the driver market more than Charles is. Obviously, he's locked in for the next few years. Um, so, yeah, a strong race for Ferrari, I think. And I'm excited to see what they can do in China on the first sprint weekend of the year, because we know they were really strong on sprints last year. So we've already spoken about Lando Norris slightly questioning the team's strategy for him today. Uh, he started in P3, ended P5. Oscar also lost two places. He started in P6, ended in P8. Um, we're seeing that the McLaren is perhaps lacking straight line speed compared to their competitors this year, um, potentially because they haven't made such a big step over the winter compared to a team like Ferrari. Um, but how do you think they'll be reflecting on their day in Japan? Yeah, it seemed that Lando was a little bit disappointed in the post-race interview. I, I mean, he mentioned that the gap for the lead last year was 19 seconds, and now in 2024 it's 29. I don't think this is a big of an issue as he made it out to be, though, because obviously Japan was much later in the calendar last year, and they had time to sort of develop on that car and catch up a bit more than they have this year. I mean, we're in the fourth mm. race in. Um, I think maybe a little bit of patience needs to come with McLaren. They need to get a few upgrades out and get the car to a bit of a better point. Um, but the early pit stop did surprise Lando a little bit, I think. Yeah, I mean, Andrea Stella has said that they did that earlier stop with Lando versus the people he was competing with uh, to try and go for the podium. But I think today their pace just wasn't there compared to the Ferrari of Carlos and even Leclerc. Um, you know, they wanted to try and attack Perez. I think realistically that's a bit out of the window at the moment to try and attack the Red Bull with where they are. Um, we know Red Bull have made a massive step over the winter. It seems, you know, they're kind of carrying on having those 20 second leads um, versus anyone else. Ferrari have also made a step over the winter. So, yes, McLaren are slightly behind. Again, we know Lando's very hard on himself and is very critical of their performance after a race, which will no doubt fuel them to do better. And we've seen that over 2023. Um, but again, they need that development over the year. And if we were to do the Japanese Grand Prix again at the end of the year, it would probably be a similar story to last year's. Um, so again, as you said, I think it being earlier in the year, the conditions being slightly different as well, perhaps has affected their car. And then this is the first kind of cooler race slightly that we've had. Um, you know, Australia, Bahrain, Jeddah were all quite warm races. So perhaps they're learning something about how to run their car under those, under those conditions as well. We also saw Lando trying to cover off George Russell. Um, and that meant that he stopped on the same lap as Leclerc trying to do this. And it didn't really work because Russell split them at the pick exit and Lando ended up behind. So that cost him a position there. In terms of Oscar, he had that uh, trouble with George Russell at the final chicane. Can you explain a bit what happened there and what the stewards made of that after the race? 
Yeah, so it was a little bit of an odd um, move. Sort of George Russell kind of dived down the inside of Oscar Piastri at the final chicane, but didn't really leave Oscar enough space. Um, so Oscar complained over the radio that he thought he was pushed off and sort of cut the chicane. Yeah, ultimately, the stewards did decide that there was no further action needed for that, though, which I think was fair. It was kind of, you know, George didn't really have enough space to make the apex without pushing Oscar off. Um, so I think that probably was the right decision from them. And ultimately, I think it was probably better that Oscar did just take that avoiding action rather than having a crash that would end both of their races. So speaking of Mercedes, uh, it was a pretty terrible day for them out in Japan. George made up a couple of places. He started P9 and ended P7. Lewis started P7 and ended P9. Um, you know, not an, not the results they would be looking for, but unfortunately the results that they've come to expect perhaps from uh, some of these weekends at the moment. Toto has said now after the race that the team is in a rebuild phase. Um, you know, they obviously know that things aren't working for them, so they're trying to switch now to some live experiments and live testing um, to try and get things better for 2026. And I think that's kind of a realistic option for them at the moment. They were a little bit encouraged, though, from what they've seen in Japan, potentially because the weather was cooler. Um, so what do you think they'll be making of their weekend? And what do you think they need to work on as well going forward now with this supposed live testing that they're going to be doing? Yeah, I think this is probably a wise decision for Mercedes to focus on testing their car a little bit more and, and getting to understand it a bit better so that maybe they could bring some upgrades further down the line to help mm. improve it. I think the key point that they need to be working on is managing higher temperatures. Obviously, we saw some cooler weather sort of earlier on in the weekend, which kind of masked their problems. And I think they thought that maybe they were going to perform slightly better than they did because of this. And obviously, as the Grand Prix was slightly warmer than expected, their real issues came out again and obviously their results say uh, what happened really. Yeah, I'm not really sure whether the problem with their car is the car itself or whether it's their understanding of the car. So maybe this live testing will help them to determine that and whether they just need to almost completely start from scratch and just wait until 2026 with the new regulations and go from there or whether some live testing might help them to understand the car a bit better and be able to create better um, setups for it and maybe create some upgrades for it that will help them solve their issues. Yeah, I think alongside testing car issues, I'd be quite keen for them to test some team processes as well, I guess is what you would call it, like their pit stops. I know we've only really seen them work on their pit stops equipment and their training in that sort of area this year. They didn't really see it as a priority in the previous years because they were just able to, you know, again, mask a problem with their race pace, but now they're not in a situation where that can work for them um i mean today in terms of strategy we saw them trying to stick with a pre pre sort of decided plan a predetermined plan um of what they were going to do and then when that became perhaps not possible because of traffic and track position they still waited to take their stops despite them having zero pace on the tire at that point um so i think perhaps they need a little bit more adaption to circumstances as they arise in a race situation um I don't really know what they would have done differently today. I'm not saying that. I'm just trying to get at the point that they perhaps could then, if they're not so focused on results at the moment, they could sort of try to experiment a little bit with these sorts of processes and try some outlandish strategies and maybe try and bring them out in a bit of traffic and get a bit of dirty air running and see how that affects the car. Um, and that could then inform how they move on in the future and how they come back in 2026, perhaps, with their better car, with knowing all this knowledge and run their car in some trickier circumstances instead of always trying to get the ideal result and being very results um, focused. Let's focus on experimenting and trying anything that we can to to best inform the future direction that they take. Yeah, it's very odd to me when you look at what Mercedes used to be as a team and they were this sort of unbreakable kind of like Red Bull are now. Mm, yeah, it's strange to me. Obviously, we've, we're a couple of years into their issues but how quickly it has turned around to the point where, you know, they're needing to look at pit stops and stuff to make an improvement. Um, it's got quite desperate for them, really. And, I, you know, I hope they can solve this so that we can have some more teams running towards the front. Um, but I really don't see anything changing drastically until 2026 with the new regulations. No, I would. Is it desperate, though, I would say, you know, like you look at we were talking earlier about Red Bull and how they you know they have one small issue and that issue barely ever comes back up for them again whereas at mercedes they seem to have that issue and sort of brush it under the carpet and forget about it and it comes up again be it pit stops be it strategy be it the car itself um red bull seem to have a very adaptive attitude to the race and an adaptive attitude to how they run their team 
Whereas Mercedes seem a little bit stuck in, we were doing so well, why aren't we doing so well anymore? Um, and kind of just trying to get their results better rather than focusing on the processes that are going on within the team, as I said earlier. Um so perhaps that's just the way teams need to be run these days. You know, we're seeing teams being run by the engineers a little bit more. Ayo Komatsu and, and uh, Lauren Mekis at RB. We're seeing them have that co- sort of engineering perspective on how a team is run um, rather than a business perspective and a results focused perspective. So maybe that's a little bit of what they need. Um, and maybe that's the key to success in this new era of regulations in experimenting a bit more and maybe they'll find that now as they begin to do this for the rest of this year but it's I think it's slightly disappointing for Lewis you know he's going to end his time with this team his 12 year run with this team doing experiments and testing for a car that he's ultimately probably never going to drive um as he moves to Ferrari but for George it'll be a good chance for him to sort of put himself as that team leader and maybe just start to take on that role this year and direct a little bit of where he wants things to go and try and take a bit of onus on himself to to sort of direct the team with how he wants the car built and start to build the team around him even while Lewis is still there maybe. Yeah I think it, it's definitely interesting and it makes me wonder at what point do Mercedes begin to look at their leadership because we've had mm. all these other teams switch to having engineers as their team leaders and yeah. that's where they've sort of made their jumps. Obviously Toto Wolf is a very business-minded um, leader um, and I, obviously he's just signed that new contract but do they need to look at making a change around there going into the next regulations? Because all the teams that have made that change have made a, a, a good jump. Um, it's interesting to me as well that sort of last year, the problem was almost certainly the car. And yeah. they knew that going into the going into this year, that the W15 was going to hopefully solve all these problems. They were going to be able to, rather than being a bit of a Frankenstein car, they were going to be able to build it again up from the ground and have, the, have it the, the way that they wanted it. Um, but now they've still got these problems with the W15. We're looking towards the team and, and the leadership and asking mm. questions about that and whether that needs to be improved rather than it being specifically the car. Yeah, I just hope for them that they can sort of improve by 2026. And if that involves doing some live testing during the races and stuff, then so be it. As long as they can make an improvement by then and just accept that, then that might have to be the way it is. Okay, so on to a Mercedes-powered team, coincidentally, and Aston Martin. Fernando Alonso started P5, ended P6, and Lance Stroll started in P16 and ended in P12. So a bit of a recovery drive for him. Um, I don't know about you, but I kind of feel at the moment that Lance Stroll is just terrible at qualifying. I feel like he always has been a little bit bad at qualifying, but then he races okay, and he races quite well to recover from his bad qualifying. So if you... If he was able to put in a better qualifying performance, then perhaps he would be having those higher results and those points finishes and be up there competing with Fernando. Because obviously, the, although Fernando is clearly a very skilled driver, um, the car clearly also has pace and is able to battle at the top end of the midfield, if not for those podium positions potentially in the future. Um, what did you make of their race? We saw Fernando playing some little games again at the end, potentially. So um, what did you make of that? Yeah, I think that was classic Fernando, really, um, giving Piastri the DRS to avoid, so that he could avoid being overtaken by Russell, which ultimately didn't actually work out. But again, it's kind of showing that Fernando's always thinking another step ahead of everybody else. You know, he's planning on how he can keep uh, Piastri yeah. behind him so he doesn't lose his place. Um, obviously, Aston Martin did bring some upgrades this weekend to the side pod, the floor and the beam wing. There was an interesting radio message from Stroll about the car having awful straight line speed. I'm not sure whether this is a result of the upgrade, so maybe that's something they need to look into. But he was joking around saying that it's like they're in a different category. It was it was a bit of a GP2 engine-esque <laughs> yeah. uh, radio message. Um, but that's definitely something the team will need to look into if the drivers think that that's quite a big problem. It could be something like we saw RB do. We saw them run a slightly draggier setup to prioritise the higher downforce Um which obviously compromised their straight line speed, but it did mean that Yuki was able to put on some great overtakes around the corners. And we saw Stroll doing that as well uh, through the S's. So perhaps they had a similar setup in that way and the upgrades will potentially move in a different direction in, for the next race and prioritise what that track needs. Yeah, it was an interesting uh, decision for them to give Stroll the upgrades first. Um, apparently this was because they were added in bits as the team repaired his chassis following his crash in Saudi Arabia. Mm. Um, and uh, Alonso only actually got the upgrades after Friday free practice. So he wasn't really able to practice with them at all until qualifying um, and obviously just thrown in at the deep end and sort of 
given these upgrades to work with yeah. and qualify with. Um, but Mike Crack did say that the stagger was to allow for comparisons between the two cars because this was something that they didn't do last season. Obviously, that's quite a positive note for Aston Martin because they had this sort of plateau last season where they started off really strong and by the end of the season were kind of matching everybody else. So it's nice to see them looking at their weaknesses from last season and improving on that now. Mm -hmm. And I think that reflects really positively on Mike Crack and his leadership. Uh, and I hope it works out well for them. Yeah, I think they could be trying to potentially emulate a bit of a McLaren development trajectory like we saw for them for 2023. Um, you know, they're starting potentially on the back foot. They've not had some podiums or anything like they had last year, this year. Um, but perhaps that's better in the long run. You know, we could see them now come sort of these European races when that leg of the season starts, um, having some more podiums as they bring more upgrades. Um, so yes, they're at a potentially worse baseline right now, but that could get better as the year goes on and they could end on a high that then allows them to develop from that high into a higher high into 2025. Um, so potentially they've taken inspiration from that McLaren approach, but definitely interesting that they gave Stroll the upgrades first. I agree with you there, but obviously it's only for practice. Um, but also interesting that we saw Fernando outperforming Stroll even without the upgrades and then again with the upgrades. So obviously Fernando's on a different level. We know that. Um, but I thought that Stroll ran an impressive race today. He had some impressive uh, Sonoda-like moves around the outside of the S's. Um, so some good racing from them and hopefully it's all on the up for Aston Martin. So it was a bit of a tale of two halves down at uh, VCARB or RB. Uh, Daniel Ricciardo started in P11, his highest starting position of the year so far, but he DNF'd after that collision with Alex Albon uh, on lap one, just at turn three. Uh, Yuki, on the other hand, he started P10 and ended in P10 also, bringing home his first points finish on home soil. Uh, what did you make of the incident with Daniel? Let's start there on lap one. Yeah, I think just as the stewards determined, it was quite clearly just a racing incident. Um, obviously Daniel was kind of in the middle of the track, Lance was to his left and Albon was coming around the outside of him to his right. Um, I think he was probably watching where um, Lance Stroll was on his inside and probably didn't notice that Alex Albon had slightly better traction coming out of turn two going into turn three um, and was able to sort of send it around the inside of Daniel Ricciardo. So as he moved out to the right, he just clipped Alex Albon and obviously they both ended up in the tyre barrier. Obviously a, a big shame for his race because he qualified so well compared to where he had been qualifying. Um, he was just 0 0.055 seconds off Sonoda and I really did think that they might have a double points finish today to be honest. Um, so again disappointing but I think now Daniel just needs to focus on China and hopefully everything will come together for him. I think it's just a bit of a stroke of bad luck to be honest. Um, I don't think that's really on him. Um, again just a, a racing incident. No, I agree. I do think, though the team obviously isn't to blame for what happened, no one is to blame for what happened ultimately, it was a racing incident, but I did think the choice to start them both on the medium was quite interesting when they're in effectively the defending positions for the top 10 and for the points. They started them on the medium. Everyone behind them, I believe, was on the soft, um, Hulkenberg, Bottas, Albon, etc. Um, so a bit of an interesting choice from the team, I don't know how they were going to play that as the race went on. They were obviously trying to go longer than these soft runners. I think the V car potentially had better race pace and maybe they felt that as well, um, that they could use that to extend on the drivers behind them and um, bring the race back in their way after potentially losing some places at the start. But I think if you're in those positions, surely it's more wise perhaps to defend rather than to try and go for an attack in the long run like focus on the positions you have at the minute rather than trying to have to get them back later on in the race because you don't know what's going to happen ultimately none of that mattered for Daniel but for Yuki it all worked out quite well you know having that red flag strangely though it was his teammate it helped him switch to the soft for the restart um, and then he ran a double hard strategy for the rest of the race, which meant he gave up track position at his first stop to the midfielders. Um, and his second stop was a bit interesting, a bit crazy. He pitted at the same time as Bottas, Magnussen, Stroll and Sargent. But RB pulled out all the stops and put in a fantastic pit stop, which uh, meant that Yuki was able to overtake everyone apart from Stroll in the pit lane. Um, he came out in a net P10, P11 on track because Nico Hülkenberg still had to uh, stop ahead so obviously that made their race for them some fantastic work there from the team and we're seeing them also you know I feel like a bit of a theme of this discussion today is marginal gains perhaps you know looking at your pit stops looking at your team processes but under Lauren Mecky's leadership I've been very impressed with how RB have run this sort of their pit stops their strategy perhaps as well um 
you know, they seem to have everything underhand at the minute and it's their car that's giving them more troubles than their processes in other areas. I think something we're yet to note uh, so far as well is the fact that both drivers had the upgraded floor for this weekend. Um, obviously, Daniel wasn't able to run it as much as Yuki was with um, Ayumu Wasa taking over his seat in FP1, FP2 being rainy, and then obviously he only had FP3. But he is doing a tyre test now on Tuesday with Pirelli at Suzuka. Um, so he'll be able to kind of experience the car with that new floor then a bit more. Um, obviously, he didn't even get the race distance to sort of experience it either, to, either earlier today. Um, obviously, it won't be on representative tyres, but I think that will probably help him just to build up some more confidence with the car. And also now heading into China, he's supposed to be having a new chassis. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully that might bring him some confidence as well. Whether that will actually fix any issues, we're not sure of, because obviously we don't know if there's an issue with the current chassis. Um, but it's nice that the team are putting out these stops for him so that he's able to sort of test his confidence and build up some confidence. And he's not typically the type of driver to really blame the car. He's, I think he's quite... Um... He internalises his troubles quite a lot, I think, doesn't he? Like he's quite he'll take it on board as him and never blame the team and never blame the car. But now, as you're saying, now that he is, maybe there is something wrong. Exactly, yeah. So uh, I, I think I'm feeling positive heading into China for Daniel. I think it'll be useful for him to um, have this Pirelli tyre test now on Tuesday, get a little bit more confidence with the car, with the new floor, and then head into China with the new chassis. And, and hopefully he can bring it back a points finish. Yeah, definitely. I think the having that new floor and being able to run that in the tyre test will be very beneficial, especially going into the sprint weekend in China now where he's only going to have an hour tops of practice, um, provided there's no red flags or any disruption to that. So it could even end up being less. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't feel overly negative actually about Daniel at the moment, despite the troubles that he seems to be having. This weekend obviously looked a lot better for him um, and he didn't have the build through the weekend as he perhaps wants to get that confidence come race day I think we we've seen that he's quite he's a driver that benefits from having a good run in practice get everything he wants to out of the car so that he can go into qualifying and then he needs that build then through the qualifying session as well to be able to make Q3 and I think we saw he had that a little bit this weekend um obviously he made it didn't quite make it into Q3 but he was almost there um so yeah negatives out in the media I think but I think he doesn't feel perhaps the pressure so much anymore. I think he knows that what they're doing is the right thing to try and help him move forward and move beyond this slower start to the season he's had. And yes, if this trouble is continuing mid-season, then perhaps there will be more questions asked by the team. But at this point, they're supporting him and he's working with them to try and better the car as well. Ultimately, you know, we have to be realistic. This is still generally an Alpha Tauri um, and they were finishing last and, you know, right at the back of the field last year. Um, so improvements, but I think more to come. Yeah, I think as well, just touching on what you said about the media, I think it's being really over-exaggerated by the media. Yeah. Obviously, we keep having the cameraman sort of filming Liam Lawson when something goes <laughs> wrong for Daniel Ricciardo. I, I just think that's a bit ridiculous, to be honest, because he is doing so much for the team yeah. outside of just driving the car. Obviously, with technical development, um, the team has said how much they value him for those reasons. And I think replacing him is just not necessary. And I, I don't think the team are even interested in doing that at the moment. No. Um, so I kind of wish that sort of media would calm down a little bit and just give him some time to build the confidence to get on with the car because he's obviously adding so much to the team elsewhere. OK, so on to Williams and Alex Albon, of course, DNF'd after that uh, collision with Daniel Ricciardo, as we've spoken about. But he started P14, so not an awful qualifying. Um, and Logan Sargent ended up in P17 after starting P19. I did sort of feel like Logan was potentially going to end up in the points at a point in this race. I don't know if that was a bit delusional of me. Um, but he looked promising, but then obviously he ran off into the gravel at Degna 2 in the closing moments of the race, reversed the Williams out of the gravel trap, perhaps a little bit riskily, but what else was he supposed to do? And that obviously effectively then ruined his race. He was right at the back, covered in dust and with some flat spotted tyres, so not the greatest day out. Um, but Williams find themselves in a little bit of bigger trouble beyond this race. Uh, what's the situation? Yeah, so Williams are in a really difficult position at the moment in terms of spare parts, um, obviously, they had the issues with the chassis in Australia. Um, and now just generally, obviously, Logan's crashed. Uh, how many times now? Twice this weekend. Um, I, I'm not sure he did any damage actually going into the gravel trap. But um, either way, they, they've still got this problem. Um, Alex Albon crashed uh, in Australia and now again in um, 
Japan, quite significant crashes, both of them. And so they're going to have a lot of problems with building up a new car ready for China, I think. Um, and then even after China, getting to Miami with enough spare parts if something goes wrong there. They're in a really difficult situation and I do feel for them because I think James Vowles is definitely taking the team in the right direction, especially over the long term. And I think hopefully, well, hopefully this short term setback doesn't set them too far back kind of thing. And they're able to continue this progress because I, I do feel like they, they could become a really strong team in the next in the next few years. Um, yeah, it's definitely an interesting situation because it's not something I think I've ever seen before with spare parts and spare chassis. Um, I think some journalists were also saying that Alpine don't have a spare chassis. And whether this is down to the cost cap or whether this is down to um, development problems and coming into the season with the right amount of parts, we don't know. Um, but it's definitely a theme that I don't really want to see continue in Formula One because I think it's it's not what Formula One's about. You know, it's you shouldn't be coming and struggling to race. Um, you should have enough thing. You should have enough items to be able to race, and if you crash, replace anything. Um, so yeah, I, I think it is a little bit of a sad direction if that's the way that the sport's going. And I'd like to see maybe the FIA implement something. I'm not sure what they could do. Um, but yeah, there, there definitely needs to be some questions raised about spare parts and spare chassis within Formula One. Yeah, there was definitely... I figured that Williams didn't have a spare chassis because of their development problems and getting parts built over the winter. I mean, obviously, there was a lot in the media about how archaic their processes were at the factory and, you know, they were running the car build on Excel, for example, um, and just no one really knowing what the timelines were and all sorts of issues like that. And I figured that was why they didn't have a spare chassis and perhaps that is the case for Williams. But hearing now that Alpine and potentially others don't have these spare parts either is slightly more concerning, as you say, to the direction things are going. Um, surely not everyone is having these problems of such archaic development in their factories. You know, Alpine is a manufacturer team. If this is the situation they find themselves in then what is the situation going on at a team like Sauber or a team like Haas potentially where there are uh, known budget problems you know especially at Haas um whether this is a reflection of as we said earlier these engineers coming in these people with engineering mindsets coming in and, and leading the team and wanting these better processes in place and things that previously went unnoticed and weren't uh, worried about so much and now being picked up by the people who've worked on the other side and have worked to build the cars and develop the cars you know, with their own hands potentially at points. So I don't know where it's going to go for Williams. They could be in some trouble if it turns out that Alex Albon has broken this chassis in this crash. He, in his post-race interview, I thought he sounded quite worried. I don't know if that was a bit of adrenaline because obviously he was speaking after the incident um, immediately while the race was still going on. But I thought he sounded quite worried and quite anxious about um, the situation that they find themselves in now. Obviously he was... It was his fault that the situation has arisen in the first place in Australia, and now it's his fault again, not his fault, sorry, and now it's his car again, sorry, that is um, struggling with parts because he's suffered this crash at turn three. Um, and he was the one as well before going into the weekend saying that they need to be sensible, and obviously this wasn't what they wanted. So, yeah, I mean, he, he was saying in his post-race interview that the tyre barrier potentially means that there was a bigger problem with the way he damaged the car you might have done some more damage than he was initially expecting you know it wasn't that big of a crash but because it was into a tire barrier the tires went under the car and he said it stopped very violently which is not what you see when you crash into a tech pro barrier for example um so i guess they just need to wait and see how the car is when it gets to the garage james vowels did say that he'd seen pictures after the crash from a team member that they sent out trackside to go and have a look at it and it did look repairable but obviously they won't know deeper issues potentially with the chassis that is the big problem until they get it stripped off in the garage um so yeah bit of a trouble down at williams not really sure how they're going to get past this potentially until miami when they get this spare chassis yeah and i think if they're spending all their time repairing chassis and repairing cars it does make me wonder where their development will go for the rest of the year obviously you don't want to just be spending or you don't want to you don't want your whole workforce to be working on just repairing um, yeah. carbon monocoques every week um, <laughs> you want them to be sort of building and developing these new upgrades so I don't know whether the effects of this will also strike Williams a bit later on in the season in terms of their development um, I guess something we'll just have to wait and see so on to stake and Valtteri started in p14 ended in p14 and Joe started p20 and ultimately dnf'd with a gearbox issue 
Although that is a negative for them, they've suffered a mechanical fault there. It wasn't all bad for Stake. Yeah, Valtteri said that their overall pace was looking quite strong. Obviously, Kick Sauber did bring some upgrades coming into this weekend. Um, so I think it's positive that they can walk away knowing that the pace had improved because of these upgrades. Um, he thinks that the pace should have allowed them to finish higher than they did today as well, and that he believed he could have finished in the points if he hadn't had so much traffic after his second stop. Obviously, this is very, very positive for Kick. They're yet to score points yet this season. Yeah, and heading into China, Zhou's home race, they're going to hope that this pace continues and that maybe they could bring up their first um, points finish. Um, obviously, Zhou did have his mechanical fault with his gearbox, and because of this, had a tricky pit stop, but then was told to retire the car. Um, it was a difficult weekend overall for Zhou. He had some smaller issues over the weekend and the reduced runtime meant that his qualifying pace was affected. So he did only qualify in P20 um, and needed a good recovery race. He was getting that until he was told to retire the car. Um, and so now his focus is on preparation for his first home Grand Prix. Uh, obviously, that's going to be very exciting for him. Um, I think every driver looks forward to their home Grand Prix. And obviously, we've missed China now the last few years. So I'm, I'm sure he'll be glad to get there and meet some of his home fans. Yeah, definitely. I think he's going to be really excited for that weekend and potentially also excited because their pit stops weren't so bad today. Um, they've had a lot of issues with their pit stops in the previous rounds with over 30 second stops in uh, Jeddah and in Australia as well. Um, although that was on Valtteri's side of the garage, but they didn't have that problem today, potentially because we know that it's an issue with temperature, that as the car is getting warmer, the wheel nuts are expanding, and so the wheel gun can't grip them, and they're cross-threading the wheel nuts effectively, so they can't get the wheel off. Um, this is because they've made some upgrades to the parts and to the wheel nuts, and potentially also to the guns, to try and cut down on fractions of a second, and ultimately it's ended up costing them 30 seconds. Um, so... One of those marginal gains that's become a bit of a maximal loss, um, if yeah. you like. It's a bit weird to me that they haven't just reverted that part. Um, they can't do that because of the suspension. These parts are compatible oh. only with their new suspension. Um, you know, that's a, I think that's a thought everyone's had. Why don't you just put it back? So Right, yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, but yeah, good that it wasn't such a problem today, but potentially masked uh, by the weather. We saw that it was quite a cool Grand Prix. Yes, the race started quite warm but the clouds came over and so the car temperature perhaps wasn't building up so much as it was in Australia or in Jeddah where it was warmer um so it'll be interesting to see now in China whether this problem is actually fixed it's going to take them several weeks to get these parts made and machined and properly fixed but whether this little temporary um solution that they've got in place has actually worked today or it's just a factor of the conditions uh, remains to be seen so moving on to Haas, Nico Hülkenberg started in P12 and made up a place to P11, and Kevin Magnussen started P18 and made up five places to end in P13. Uh, he took a one-stop race, excluding obviously the tyre change at the red flag right at the start. Um, so not a bad day out for Kevin, and also not a bad day for Nico, despite some interesting starts. Yeah, Nico was quite annoyed to miss out on the points, obviously, as you would be finishing in P11. Um, he had a bit of a tricky start. He dropped back um, quite significantly, almost to the back of the uh, back of the pack, um, and so I think he was glad to have been able to recover from that to P11. Um, that shows that the car probably had quite good pace. Maybe again, it was the cooler conditions. I guess it's the same with the Ferrari engine in the Kick Sauber, and I guess that's similar to the Ferrari car itself. Maybe the the cooler conditions is just something that the Ferrari engine prefers. This is something that Io Komatsu actually said. Um, he said that perhaps the cloudy conditions helped them manage better. But overall, I think Nico was happy to have been able to keep up with the midfield teams. And if you compare this Haas to the Haas of last season, I think obviously it's night and day. Really, the fact that they're able the fact that they're just not even dropping like a stone in the Grand Prix is, is a positive for them. Yeah, I mean, I'm incredibly impressed with Haas's start to the season. You know, Ayo Komatsu, this is his first year as the leader of the team and he sort of made his debut saying, don't expect us to be anything but last. Um, and they've been practically anything but last at the moment. They're doing incredibly well, um, claiming some points as well. Good teamwork as well, as we saw in Jeddah between uh, Kevin and Nico. So they're, I think the team itself is running well at the moment and it's perhaps not something we saw under the leadership of Gunter Steiner, unfortunately. You know, as good of a personality he was, maybe he wasn't the right person to be running that team and taking it to the next phase of their development and using their budget as well. I think that's a really important point for Haas, using the budget efficiently. Um, and perhaps Aikamatsu, again, as we said earlier, seems to be a bit of a theme, another engineer at the top, um, managing the budget, managing the team incredibly well. 
Um, strategy wise, we saw that Hulkenberg ran a two stop. Kevin, as I said earlier, went for a one stop. Um, but this meant that he lost some places at the end because he was running quite long on that hard tyre. Um, so he lost some places to people who had fresher tyres uh, because they had been on a two stop. So that cost him a couple of places. Um, but overall, definitely not a bad day at all for Haas and not a bad weekend either. They had some issues with car balance on Friday, but obviously managed to fix that by today. Um, Nico had a couple of issues at the start. He went into anti-stall and that cost him some places. But as you say, the race pace allowing him to make that up. So not a bad weekend at all for Haas. And it'll be very interesting to see how they get on um, in this first sprint weekend of the year next time out. So from a team who should be encouraged by the weekend to perhaps a team who uh, will be a bit discouraged by their performance, uh, Alpine. Uh, Esteban Ocon started in P15, ended P15, and Pierre started uh, P17 and ended P16. I think no one will disagree by saying that that was a pretty awful weekend for Alpine. Um, we know they obviously had a terrible start to the season anyway. It looked a little bit more promising for them in Australia, but right back down the bottom again this weekend in Japan. I think perhaps Ocon celebrating a little bit too much when he's just managed to get into Q2 shows the state of the situation and is reflective of the bigger picture for Alpine at the moment. We know their car is overweight, their engine is underpowered, and their technical director and head of aerodynamics have left. So that supposedly was in the works before these issues arose, but um, not a good situation for Alpine. How do you think that, obviously they're not going to be happy with their race, but how do you think they'll reflect on the weekend and perhaps try and come back stronger in China? Yeah, I think obviously it's a disappointing weekend for Alpine. And something that's quite interesting as well is this was them with upgrades. Whether they haven't quite understood those upgrades yet and they still need some time to work on them, I guess will will be revealed in China. And maybe the fact that that's a sprint weekend might work out slightly better for them. Maybe the qualifying is their problem and they can build up back up through the sprint and the, the actual race. We saw a little bit of contact between the Alpine drivers at the start. This supposedly gave Esteban Ocon damage. Um, I think perhaps their issues this weekend were a little bit above what that damage might have caused. Um, Esteban also had a bit of a difficult day in terms of strategy. He was on a hard, hard medium. Uh, he stopped a little bit earlier than the drivers around him on the first stop. Uh, and he said that they tried something on the strategy and it didn't work. So he's probably referring to this slightly earlier stop. Uh, Pierre also ran a two stop. He went a hard, medium, hard. But before the red flag right at the start, they were both on softs for the original start of the race. So perhaps they were going to try and make that work and try and um, they were obviously aware perhaps that others around them only had softs remaining. So we're also going to try that. But this, you know, everyone starting on softs is going to reveal a pace deficit either way. You know, if they're on even tyres, it's not going to give them an advantage. So, yeah, it probably still would have been a little bit tricky for Alpine, even if they've been able to make this soft start work. Um, as we said earlier, they're also a team with no spare chassis. So they've got a lot of work to do, not only to develop their car, but also to be getting these baseline parts that every team should have going into the season ready. Um, especially at this point now, you know, we're heading into round five. Um so a little bit of a similar situation to Williams going on there back at the factory, I suppose. They've got upgrades to try and bring and a chassis to try and bring. But perhaps being a manufacturer team, they have slightly more resource for doing those simultaneously than a team like Williams, who probably have to prioritise one or the other, as we've heard from James Vowles. So it'll be interesting to see how they get on in China, um, particularly with it being a sprint weekend, as you said earlier. So that's it for our analysis of the 2024 Japanese Grand Prix. If you did enjoy, make sure to save the podcast and follow along so that every episode is automatically downloaded. And we'll see you again next week for the Chinese Grand Prix.